Matt, how are you doing, brother? My brother, it is great to see you, man. Every day is a good day, sir. I totally agree. And I think it's great to see you too. You know, I want to just dive right in. You're, you're doing some amazing things. You're the founder at Acton Academy in Placer. Yeah. I hear there's more campuses on the way. Yeah. This is a program I'm especially interested in. My wife and I, we have a, a, a young family. We have a three and a half year old. I used to be in the public conventional mainstream model of education. Uh, mm -hmm. It was brewing for several years where I needed to, for myself to work my way out of it. And I did, I resigned because there's, there's just better things. Now, what we've come to as a family is, is I knew I needed to be out of it because I saw apathy in the classroom from young learners who should be invigorated, who should be passionate, who should be really just invested in their own learning. And I saw that disappearing, not necessarily in my own classroom, but when I, I saw the steam being let out of the sails of the students when they walked in from their, from their other experience too. Mm -hmm. So I knew I needed to get out of it, um, but that still remained the issue of our, of our boy. You know, am I gonna get out of it and do something else? And then he's still lodged in that conventional model of education. So I became very uh, interested in researching and learning and reading and digging up everything I could as far as like, what would be this ideal um, open learning environment. So I was yeah. reading like, like John Gatto, and I was reading Leo Tolstoy, and I got into Ray Pete, and I got into uh, Ivan uh, Ilyich, yeah. and, and, and uh, Paul Freire, and Miles Horton, and just on and on and on and on. All those and guys that we weren't allowed to read when we got our teaching credentials? All the guys no one told us to, for sure. Yeah, they, they, for they sure. weren't on, on any purpose. list. For sure. For yeah. sure they're not on any list, yeah. <laughs> so, so I thought I was going to do my own thing, and I still think, you know, there might be some form of that happening um, for our boy and for our yep. family and for all the boys and girls like him who are growing up in a world that's becoming more divisive, um, more controlled, it seems like. It, there's just a lot of issues going on. And then I happened upon what you're doing at Acton Academy Placer. Mm -hmm. And, I, and, I, and I, I read through the website. Actually, I, I came across you because of a mutual friend of ours uh, Ryan Dewey, who owns Capital Floats in, in, uh, in Sacramento, um, we, we got talking about education. And I don't know how it came up, but it was just kind of an organic thing. And we were talking for 20, 30 minutes. And he goes, you got to meet a friend of mine. His name's Matt Bedreau. And, and so, and so I, I said, yeah, I would love to connect with him. We connected. And uh, now here we are. So would you mind going into your story, going into your yeah. background and, and sharing you're the founder of Action Academy Placer. Yeah. Where did this all come from? And, and can you talk about this a little bit? Yeah, man, glad to. And it's, I love what you said too about, you know, the, you getting out of that, uh, out of the public system and realizing like, okay, great, man, I, I can get out, but am I just going to put my own boy right back in there? Right. And that's a good dad moment. That's something that, you know, I, I talked to parents. I even sent out a tweet this morning, something to the effect of, of, um, you know, that there are so many great teachers out there. And I really, I really mean that the majority of teachers are phenomenal human beings, man. And I am the biggest supporter of teachers and administrators on the planet. I, I love them. They really are there for, you know, altruistic reasons. They want to pour into the kids. I get it, man. And, I, and I also think there's really, really good people who work at fast food places, right? There really are. There's some phenomenal folks that work at McDonald's. There's some phenomenal folks that work at Long John Silver's, whatever it is. But just because there's great people there, it doesn't mean I'm going to have my kids eat there. Right? It's, and even if it was free, I'm not going to do that. Right? The end product still matters. And so what we're talking about here is an end product that has you know, intentionally been designed not to be good, and it's, and it's only getting worse. Yeah. And so, you know, like you as a dad, there was no way I was going to sacrifice my children to that in the name of free and the name of, well, I went there and I turned out quote unquote, okay. You know, there was none of that. So I just kind of want to set all of that stuff out there. And, and, um, you know, anytime I have a parent who is thinking through those kind of things and making through, you know, those decisions, I just want to highlight that and thank you as a, as a, not even as an educator, just as a dad, yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, paying attention to that. So, um, 
Yeah, man. I mean, uh, you know, obviously the, my, my story has a weird, we just had this architect who was walking through here. We were talking about it. We realized, you know, I grew up in Vacaville. He grew up in Fairfield. Yeah. We graduated the same year. We realized we knew a ton of the same people. And he's like, so wait a second. He's like, we're the same age. And he's like, and all of the things that I know that have already gone on, he's like, you have this crazy arc. And I do, man, it's just this weird journey of, you know, being the kid that grew up as a, as a good athlete, and figuring out the game of school early on, got straight yeah. A's all through high school. Yeah. Um, but I knew how to talk to girls and play sports. Yeah. Like that was it. So then I'm like, I guess I got to go to college. I got my straight A's, came out. I was better at girls, better at sports. All right? But I had nothing to offer the world. Um, coming out, really, I thought I was going into the Secret Service. I went through that whole background process, was ready to move to DC, was offered a job at the White House and thought I was ready to roll. Um, talked to a secret service agent after I already had accepted the job. And he's like, man, don't do it. And it was somebody that was close enough where I listened. Um, but then it left me with a whole lot of nothing, you know? And so I'm, I'm 22 graduated, got my college debt, you know, and, and went great. Now I have no idea where to go. So a um, couple, couple little, you know, odd management jobs here and there ultimately led me to Stanford university where I was for a while. Um, and from Stanford, you know, my wife and I were actually both there at the time. Um, and we kind of went, look, we're going to be 80 before we ever buy anything in the Bay Area. So let's get out of here. Let's move to the Sacramento area. So we bought, did it backwards, man, bought a house and moved there. And we're like, cool, I guess we got to find some jobs. And so, uh, and that's where, you know, Stanford had kind of put me in this educational space. I got to work admissions a little bit and see the game. And when I say game, dude, it is a game of college and college admissions. Um, I got to see that game. I got to see it from all different angles, um, from the parent angle, from the student angle, from the university angle, the professor angle. I got to see that and I was like, hmm, I'm not impressed uh, with this game, but I'm gonna go in and just help from the ground up, man. I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna go into schools, right? I'm gonna do that altruistic thing and I'm gonna go help kids early so that they, they've got a leg up. So. I started teaching, I went right into teaching. Um, thankfully there was position, there was a, a program where I could get my credential while also being the teacher of record immediately. Yeah. So um, I jumped right in man in the Stockton area, which if you're not familiar with California, isn't um, known for being a great area. And uh, definitely trial by fire, man. So I taught in that, you know, in the public schools for a number of years uh, was what I called creatively insubordinate because I was like, dude, this is what's helping these kids. This is what I'm being told to do. Those two things are not the same, yeah. but I'm going to go with what's helping. Right. And so I focused there. Um, and then again, naively at the time was like, well, cool, man. Then the way I'm going to make change is I'm going to be an administrator and I'm going to do it from a site level down. Um, when you got my admin credential and as you're going through that process, I'm going to say it. So you're telling me this whole thing actually isn't about kids at all this is about money. This is about politics. This is about agendas. And then we talk, we say kids here and there, but they, this has nothing to do with them. Um, you know, so I, I cut my, my public school administrator journey very, very short. Uh, and then again, naively, I went, cool. Well, I'm going to go to private man. Cause in private, we don't have to listen to the man, you know, we don't have to listen to the rules. This is going to change everything. So you know, I go private and, and I was a private school teacher and then went into administration in private schools for, for a number of years as well. And what you realize there is private schools, for the most part, model themselves after public school. They model themselves after traditional school. You have the same kind of issues. You have the same you know, pedagogy. You have the same mindset of the parents. You have the same mindset of the kids. You see the, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're in Stockton where it can be kind of a gangland or if we're over here in, in this part of California, which is like Disneyland, it doesn't yeah. matter. Kids are having problems. Yep. Kids are apathetic. Kids have other things that they want to do. Parents have a specific agenda. The schools have a specific agenda. And what gets lost in all of these agendas is figuring out how to fire up the agenda of these young people. So they yep. want to go tackle life that always yep. gets lost. Yep. I, and I couldn't do that, dude. I could not do that anymore. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to start speaking out uh, around that, which led to people actually caring about what I had to say for one reason or another. And I got to speak more and more in education. Um, speaking more and more in education actually led to opportunities to speak to more and more Fortune 500 companies. Um, and so once that ball of speaking around the world really started rolling, 
that's when I said, okay. And I pulled the plug on, on the working in the private school. Again, my kids were coming up to school age at that point. You know, I had two at that time and my oldest was coming into the school age. I'm like, I'm not going to, she's not going to go to a traditional environment. There's just no way. Um, the speaking provided income for the family. And then it gave me the time to build uh, Act in Plaster, which is part of the global network that I think is the best global educational network going bar none. And that's the Acton Academies. I love it. And we seem to be, I'll, I'll just cut right into this. We seem to be in a, in a world landscape that is, that is anything but um, reliable, I, I guess is one way to put oh, it. Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot going on. So can, can you dive in a little bit to why Acton is such a tremendous opportunity. Can you dive into some of more of the details yeah. as to in, in this world landscape, which is, uh, yeah. you know, I, I don't think a lot of people are like feeling real great about, about Nobody's life and, super and the pumped. future. I agree. Yeah, I agree, man. Um, here's what I like. So this is what's interesting, right? So I, I wholeheartedly believe in what we are doing at, at Acton again. I mean, wholeheartedly, like it's not even obviously I have my children here. Right, I built this for my children. Anybody thinks you can just be like, oh, I'm just gonna build a school, dude. That's that's not the way it works. That's like being like, oh, I'm just gonna go to the NBA because that sounds cool, right? Like it's that. It's about the same in terms of like how easy it is to actually just do that. Yeah. Right. So it's a very difficult thing, but it was worth it for my children because I believe wholeheartedly in Acton Academy's message of the hero's journey. Right. Mm-hmm. Finding the call, helping the kids, helping everybody that walks through the doors, kids and parents, to find a calling that will allow them to change the world, right? And that sounds very cliche, but that is very much the mission that we are involved in. And we use Joseph Campbell's work in the hero's journey as kind of this archetype for what that looks like, right? Now, everybody gets on board with that archetype. Everybody gets super pumped about it when you talk about it, especially when your kids are coming out of, you know, they're, they're, they are apathetic or the parents are seeing themselves you know, in a job that they feel apathetic about and they wish, oh, if I only could go back and start over and have somebody who cared about my passions and I really tackled my passions, right? They're looking at this from their standpoint of like, oh, this is such a better opportunity for my kids and, right? And they're not wrong. I mean, it very much is. But what happens is sometimes they get overtaken with the emotion of how much better that is and they're right without remembering the fact that, look, this is, first of all, it's not a panacea because what we're talking about is the hero's journey. And in that hero's journey, there is intentional hardship. Yeah. If you know, you know, one of the fav- my favorite things that Jordan Peterson says, he says, if you know the dragon is going to be coming to your village and you just take it upon yourself to head out to his lair and fight him right now. Yeah. Right. That's why we are so good is because we have a group of people who are committed to putting these dragons in front of these kids and being like, we're here to support you. Let's go slay them. Right. And that means it's going to suck. Sometimes that means it's going to be hard. Right. That means you're going to have to learn to be resilient because you're going to actually have to overcome some things. And guess what? That's how you build strong human beings. Yeah. Right. So that's what we are doing. And that's why we are creating the leaders of the future is because we will let our kids struggle. We will let our kids fail. Of course, we want them to be fired up and passionate, but fired up and passionate doesn't mean follow your passion, which too many people go, okay, well, that is, that changes at the, you know, as the wind blows. No, it's bring your passion to every single thing you are doing, set some goals in front of you, go there, go crush it, and then evaluate and go, yeah, I want some more of that. Or you know what? That's not a place where I'm going to want to spend every day. I'm going to go ahead and change direction, create some more goals, go crush those, and then evaluate again, right? It's, well, it's yeah. the buffet of life. Well, I love that. A couple of things that it, it brought to my attention, the, the buffet of life thing. It, it, I've heard Gary Vee talk about like, like tasting as much of the menu and making the menu as big as possible when you're young because you need to taste things to figure out if you like them. And the only way you're going to know is if you dive in full heartedly yep. and, and you try. Yep. And, and like you said, you might, you might come back and say, wait, I need to readjust and, 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 and try over here now because yep. I didn't like that as much as I thought I would. But you totally. never would have known if you didn't try. Totally. A- another thing, what you said kind of reminded me of is there's a Will Smith line. And, and speaking of facing dragons, yeah. uh, Will Smith, I heard him say once, you know, he's motivated by fear. 
And the interviewer was like, well, what do you mean? You seem to have no fear. Like you seem to live your life with no fear. And he said, no, I I'm afraid of so much, but I'm motivated by fear in the sense that whatever I'm afraid of, I do because I would never want to let fear be the reason I don't do something. Right. And, and that, re- that really resonated with me. And, and it, it speaks to me on the same level as, go- as going and finding your dragons right That's now. It, That's it. Um, and, you know, you know, the last thing, I, I just want to say this, too, because this, this came to mind when I was listening to you. You're talking about the hero's journey and Joseph Campbell, which I love. And, yeah. and I haven't gotten into as much of Joseph Campbell's work sure. as I'd like to, but I think, yeah. I, think I will be doing that. And, and he, I think he has, has a line where he said, if you follow your bliss, Doors will open where before they were closed. Correct. And, and, and I thought of your own hero's journey, right? And, totally. and so you, you followed this because you, you felt there was a need for it, but yep. you also were inspired to do so. And, and yeah. you started speaking about education, about what you thought learning should be. And, yep. and doors started to suddenly open everywhere. Right. And it, 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 it just, it reminded me of your own story. That's exactly it, man. Taking action always matters. Right. It's a lot of people like to, to, to talk theory a lot. I mean, it's, that's the academic mindset in general is you just theorize about everything. Don't actually have to ever do anything. Right. But we'll sit here in the ivory tower and and just chat about it. And and we have all the world's problems. It's the guy that, you know, watches Tom Brady on the weekend goes, Oh, he should have done this. Right. Shut up. You're not playing. (laughs) You're not playing. Maybe you played in high school. Great. Good for you. But for you to know that, like, give me a break. Like it's, he's elite because he's been doing and he's done millions of times all of these reps right he's out there he's, he's making things happen um and one of the things that we talk about with our kids here is that's exactly it you follow that bliss and what following that bliss means is you actually put in the time you put in the reps you go and move forward incrementally every single day it's a consistency game it's a long tail game yeah. right and then the more you're committed to action all everything else comes out of that your discipline your motivation comes out of action it doesn't you don't get motivated first and then take action you take action and then all of a sudden your motivation appears because you start making headway in some things right you take action first you start doing things you start doing interesting things and the more interesting things you do and take on the more interesting people you get to meet the more interesting opportunities get put out in front of you but it starts with taking that step forward and not stopping yeah. on that right it's taking that action first and then all these opportunities end up presenting themselves and you get to the point where if you start out saying yes to everything you will ultimately get to the point where then now you've got to switch it and say no to a lot of things and that's a great place to be because it means you have more control over things but that doesn't happen until you take those steps i, I love that and there's also there's also something in joseph campbell or his um his work Mm-hmm. where he talks about going into the forest that every, <clears throat> that every warrior goes into the forest in a different spot, into That's a right. different dark spot right. onto a different, actually where no trail has ever been made. Right? right. And that's very important. And I see that in what you guys are doing with your young learners. It seems like you're allowing the space for everyone yeah. to creatively build their own, um, yeah. their own roadmap. And, yeah. and it seems to be in direct contrast to the conventional model, which is here's here's what it is, here's the test, and we're yeah. we're all, you know, right. learning or te- being taught basically right. being being taught to regurgitate to this one test, right. and and it seems very destructive to to what that what that hero's journey might be to each individual. Well, dude, from a logical standpoint, that would we would never let that fly in any other thing. If we all of a sudden told everybody hey, you have got to walk down this aisle of the grocery store and that is it. You can only grab food from right here. That's the only place. You can only be in that aisle with people that are your age, right? And you've got this very specific time that you've got to get it. And on Monday, you can only eat crackers. On Tuesday, you can only eat, like if we dialed things down like that, for people would lose their mind. Yeah. Right. But all of a sudden, we because we've been told, culturally speaking, that this is what school looks like. We're like, no, no, life works in specific subjects. You can only work on these subjects with somebody who's the same age as you. You're going to do those subjects at the exact same time. And by the way, if you want to go faster, 
then we're not really going to set anything up for you. If you want to go slower, we're going to make you feel like an idiot. And we're going to say that you're behind and make you feel like something is wrong with you. And then we're going to get your parents on board and we're going to make them feel like something's wrong with you too. So now everybody in your world is going to be like, well, something's wrong with you all because we set up foundationally something that's completely freaking ridiculous on its face. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if we're coming at anything, any yeah. situation in life, from a place of something's wrong, like, like I feel uh, inept or, mm -hmm. or I feel insecure or I feel like there's something I need to do to fix myself, mm -hmm. then whatever situation we're, we're tackling or whatever we're, relationship we're building, it's, it's not going to be as healthy or, or we're not going to be able to give as much to it as if we were coming from a place of I'm it, I have it. I am that golden Buddha. I think that's another like Joseph Campbell thing. Like yeah. th that just needs to be uncovered or chipped away at from all the conditioning that, that kind of destroyed that presence and that, yeah, that I consciousness. Mean, it's, a, it's a mental game, right? I mean, it really is this mental game. It's a, it's a um, you know, I look at it from a, a, a parenting standpoint, right? Like I'm always psychoanalyzing my own children, right? Like I'm just watching that very intently and not like in a, I'm stressed out about it way. I'm just always paying attention, right? I pay attention to humans and human behavior. And, yeah. um, you know, I want my children to be strong human beings. I want them to be um, content. I want them to be, you know, there's a rule in our house of being an emotional ninja, right? I want them to be that emotional ninja that can take the good, can take the bad equally well, and they can just continue to move forward. They can be as objective as humanly possible for that, right? So there's, you have to really be able to ride the line of, of a couple of different things. You have to have self-confidence that says, no, I'm okay, I'm good. Um, I don't know this yet, maybe, or I can't do this yet, but it's a yet, and I'm just gonna work there, right? But you also have to not live in the clouds of, of this, like, I am, I am perfect and I have everything figured out. And when somebody's like, uh, you know, hey, you, you, you don't have this part figured out. Which, well, yes, that's where entitlement comes in, right? Yeah. Because you have a false belief in your abilities that you actually have never done anything, right? And I don't want them to be entitled either. I want them to be aware of where they still need to have that work with full confidence that if I see value in this, then I can get myself to the place I need to be, right? And it's writing that balance and having them be as objective as possible through that. It's how I try to live my life too. You know, I know where I suck. Um, and then I make the decision, do I stay at that level or do I see value in bumping up my level or do I just need to now partner with somebody else who's at a higher level in this and let them take, like, what does that look like? I analyze that kind of stuff. And, you know, I mean, I want them to be able to do the same as early as possible. Well, I love that. And speaking of confidence, I, it, it kind of reminded me, I heard someone the other day, his name was Nicholas Simpson. He's in the strength, uh, strength game. And okay. he was saying, you know, so many people base their confidence on and, or their value yeah. on, on what they know yeah. or what they've done. And he yeah. said, that's, that's unfortunate, he thought, because it's always going to beat you. Because I, in a sense, like knowledge is provisional. We only know what we know until we know more, right? right. And, and, and he was saying an alternative, and you, you spoke to this a little bit with the ninja flexibility. I love that, yeah. the emotional ninja. Yeah. Um, and he, he, he described it as just, just building your ability to problem solve. And if you build your ability to problem solve and grow that, yep. that if that's where your confidence comes from, then no matter what situation you're in, no matter what conversation you're in, no matter where you are in life, you can always be confident because you can derive value from what you're going to learn from the experience sure. or, or yep. how you can form multiple perspectives from, that's from right. that experience. And basing things, you know, basing the confidence on what you know and what you've done are also traps in the fact that, you know, if, if I know that telephones work by you pick up this headset off of the wall and I speak into this thing and say, operator, I want to call David Butterworth right now. Please connect me. If I know that telephones work like that because they did at one point, yeah. what I fail to do is know that it no longer does work like that. It actually works like something completely different. You know, I mean, and there's all these other transitions. You gotta be careful of what you know yeah. as well, right? Because sometimes what you know is no longer true. You actually have to be able to unlearn and relearn something else, right? So you gotta be careful on what you know. And again, being careful on basing your value on what you have done, that can be a trap 
where you no longer do anything of value, right? You know, you just sit and rest. Everybody knows the guy that peaked in high school and is like, dude, nah. you know, it's the old Al Bundy story, right? Of like, I threw four touchdowns or whatever he used to say. And he would talk about that. But then, in the, you know, in the meantime, he hates his life. He hates his family. He's the shoe set. Like he's just, you know, he's a miserable human being. And we laugh at it because it's designed for us to laugh at this. But dude, there's people that live their life that way because yep. they, they, you know, they base that self-worth on something they did years ago. That means, you know, very little at this point. That's great. There's a frame of reference there. Keep moving forward. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's no longer con contextual. And I think Alfred North Whitehead, uh, he, he said, he said once like knowledge doesn't keep any better than fish. And, and that always stuck with me like as, that, as kind of yeah. a summary of what you yeah. just said. Uh, it, and it seems like what you're doing, I like how you're talking about good versus bad and, and, and being able to handle either of those. And to sure. me, it reminds me that what you're doing with your family and what you're doing with the, the learners uh, yeah. and their opportunities at Acton Academy is you're giving them a chance to build this love of the process. Yep. And it's not about the results. It's about the passion that they can and the, and the joy that they can derive from being involved in, in their journey. Yep. So um, that leads me to this. I kind of want to know, I know this is going to be a tough task because we aren't them, yeah. but could you try to get into the minds, into the bodies of the young learners at Acton Academy and describe what it might feel like day to day to come into the space there what 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 is this experience like maybe to the young learners for sure man well you know and there's that's a, a very multifaceted answer um because the experience looks different obviously because of so many factors it looks different developmentally speaking right the the our spark studio which is kind of like our you know five those like our five-year-olds right their experience looks vastly different then our adventure studio, it's got a bunch of like seven and eight thresholds, got a bunch of nine and 10 discovery, you know, they're middle schoolers, right? So they're already hormonally just jacked up. Um, and then you got, you know, high schoolers, they're dealing with all the high school stuff. So all of that obviously plays into the experiential part. And then, you know, if we're really going to back out of that concept, you know, depending on who the parents are, which is why it's so important to me, who the parents are of these individuals, right? They're obviously looking through a different lens there too. So there's so many different lenses that are layered upon, um, you know, each individual hero that, that comes in here. So, um, but I can most readily obviously speak to my own kids yeah. um, because I do really kind of know what their experience looks like and how they view everything. And I know they're all in different you know, stages that they're all in different studios. Um, but I hear from them and I see from them, you know, what that looks like. Um, you know, on the younger side, man, my, my boy yesterday had a little bit of, a, um, and you know, and you've gotten to meet my kids. And so, yeah. um, they're all very social creatures. They love people and they just, they love to hang out and just chat. And they're just, they're very, um, you know, every parent's biased, but I think they're pretty down to earth, like cool humans, you know, and, and they're um, pretty rad. In, you're pretty in, rad, man. That's I my agree. Thank you. Too. And, and um, I mean, they're, they're a lot of fun, dude. So my little man um, yesterday had a little bit of a, like a, a little bit of a sniffle, but he was fine. He's like, man, I feel good. Like, I'm not sick. I am not sick. I feel good. We're like, okay, people are super sensitive right now. We're going to, yeah. you know, whatever, like we're going to, and there's been a bunch of people sick in your studio. So we're going to, we're gonna just going to stay home um, today. Just have you stay home today and go back in tomorrow. And it was just like, you know, and he gave me he like the, the fate, like you could tell he wanted to cry, but he's just like nodding his head. He's like, okay, I, I can do this. But he's like, he wanted to cry because he wants to be here so bad. Now you see that for a lot of four and five year olds that are social anyways, you see that almost anywhere because they just love the social aspect of it. Right. For him, for that studio, it's all about play, man. Those kids are there and, and they know they're going to get to play. They know they're going to get to see their friends. But what is a little different there too is they take value, um, they, they see the value without knowing why in the fact that they're also going to get choices, Yeah. right? They understand that and they look forward to being able to actually make choices while they're there at that Huge. age, Huge. right? It's a big deal. Yeah. Now, we don't go by the, um, you know, there is, there is kind of a... a I don't want to say it's pervading, but there is a cultural belief for some people that, look, man, it's you just drive by the absolute sovereignty of your four and five-year-old. Like any decision they make is a great decision and you just let them go. Natural consequences, good, bad. I don't see that playing out well long-term, um, but we do believe in them getting choices. So the way we frame, you know, frame their day 
is this studio. I mean, you guys are going to have choices. Here is really good choice A, really good choice B, great choice C, D, E, F, and G. All of those are really great choices. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Right? And we start there. So they've got to think through, they got to weigh their choices and they get to go, you know, change their mind. They're making the decisions, but they're making decisions out of a buffet of good decisions. I love it. Right. We're not throwing the chocolate cake in there with it. We're just saying, look, man, here's some lean protein over here, some vegetables over here, some good, like give them all the good stuff. Take your choice where you want to go. Right. And they look forward to that and they find value in that. He talks about his process of like, Ooh, and then this time it was like, we could have done the puzzle over here. I could have done this game over here. And this guy was doing this, but I wanted to go here because, and he walks through his mindset around that. Right. And so, which is super cool to see as that, that really kind of pervades up through like the next, it really kind of pervades up through the next studio too. They start taking on, um, you know, more responsibility there. They start taking on more jobs there of, of, um, you know, some extra maintenance around and things like that, but they're still kind of in this choice mode. But what you start seeing in that next level up is they also start to grasp the concept of how to interact with another human being, especially if they disagree. Uh. That next layer is where they start to um, get the tangible skills to work with, to have an adult level conversation without necessarily the emotional side being there yet, which is a really good thing. It gives them that practice without really being that emotionally like, I'm not that tied to my own idea yet. Yeah. You know, so we can have this conversation. So that's for those next kids up. My daughter looks forward to having those conversations. She likes the power that comes with being able to say, Hey, what you just did right there. I don't think that's right. And here's why she also willfully goes, Ooh, like, cool. You, somebody else sees something I'm doing and things that they can help me and I can do better in a certain way. Like I'm okay. And that's really like, it's kind of that next level up. So she's super excited. Right. Which is an interesting kind of concept that kids want that kind of responsibility and those kind of conversations, but they do. That's they do. amazing. Yeah, Matt, it reminds me of like that Aristotle. I mean, he said, he said the mark of an educated man is to be able to entertain multiple perspectives without, um, without uh, believing any of them, That's exactly right? Right. With, without jumping in and, and committing to any of them. That's exactly uh, right. That's yeah. exactly right. And then if you want to take that intelligence to the next level, you're able to entertain all these thoughts. You don't necessarily jump on any, but if you do have a thought that is put in front of you and it is backed up with enough facts and enough evidence, yeah. whereas now the scale seems to tip to that idea versus a, an idea that you held prior to that, it's also an act of intelligence to go, okay, well, if I'm looking at these two ideas, this one now holds more weight, even if it's completely contrary to my prior thought. And I need to change because right now that currently holds the most evidence as far as I'm concerned. Well, it sounds like putting a tremendous value in such a healthy way on being critical, on yes. being discerning yes. and, and just thinking through choices. Like yes. when you talked about a young learner coming in and being able to literally think about what they want to do for the day and then decide yes. within a, within a gamut of options. Yep. That just reminds me of a, of an entrepreneur or a philosopher <laughs> who totally. eats breakfast and drinks a cup of coffee and says to himself or herself, what do I want to do today to yeah. grow my business? What do I want to think exactly. about today to exactly. grow my, to, to grow, grow my, my brain? That's exactly it. And so what's interesting is, you know, again, you asked me to take it from the mindset of the young person, right? And what I'm telling you is these young people here, what they really focus on, where their mind actually goes as they're walking through the day, they are so much more focused on the process of what they are doing than they are the ancillary materials in which they're using to, to, you know, uh, create some sort of outcome, right? It's the process. Yeah. The secret to a great Socratic discussion is not necessarily the topic that you are talking about. It's the process. And if you will focus your great, your Socratic discussion, you've got your Socratic circle. If you will really hone in on the process of having, you know, your, your rules of engagement of being concise, of not repeating somebody else's point of starting your you know next thing with i agree with what you said here um i disagree with what you said here adding to that like you focus on the process yeah that's where all the magic is 
the the what you discussed wasn't necessarily the the biggest part and what that then creates is somebody who can just again objectively talk about everything they can critically think around it they can um you know discuss it factually they don't get overly emotionally drawn where it's like oh what wait what you said you support trump well i hate you what you you like biden well i hate you well you just right all the problems that our society obviously has um they don't get wrapped up into that clear thinking becomes the the status quo um which leads to you know clear clear outcomes and clear behaviors well, and I think the, the idea that someone can learn through habit, learn through yeah. doing mm-hmm. to focus on the process and live a life like that, yeah. that also I think is, is a happy life. That, that means Man. that you're going to have long-term happiness because the, the results are never what gives someone joy. It's their, right. it's their involvement in the way they live their life. That's right. That's exactly it. It's one of those modern kind of stoic philosophies too. I mean, that's really it. That was really kind of the essence of stoicism itself is like, cool, control what you can control, which is you, right? There are certain things that are out of your control. You can try to, you can influence as much as humanly possible. I definitely try to do that. There's this great quote um, from the very beginning of a movie called The Departed. You ever see that movie with uh, like Jack Nicholson and it's like that gangster, you know, film about uh, Whitey Bulger, I think is, is who it's supposed to be kind of loosely based on. Right. Yeah. Leonardo Uh, DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, right. That's a great cast, man. So, but at the very beginning of the movie, Jack Nicholson's character says, I never wanted to be a product of my environment. I always wanted my environment to be a product of me. Um, And I very much, I love that. And I very much live that way. I want my environment to be a product of me, make no doubt about it. Right. I, I absolutely want that. But at the same time, I understand that only that reach only goes so far. There are things that will always and forever be out of my control, especially as it should be somebody else's life, right? All of that is ultimately out of my control. So I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to do what I can do. And I'm going to be content every single day, no matter what I'm doing, period. No matter what happens, period. Because I'm making the choice yeah. for that to be the case. You know, and something something not my way happens, the first response is, okay, good. Yeah. Great. So what am I supposed to learn from this? Like, what does this give me the opportunity to do now? You know? That's it. That's an emotional ninja. Oh yeah, I love I love that emotional ninja. That's really I'm gonna have to steal that and use that. Because we talk about ninja qualities all the time and and it's it's in the context of being flexible. So it's it's that it is that emotional ninja ness and being able to I like the idea that, you know, emotions are kind of like the weather. Like mm-hmm. it, it, they, they, sometimes they kind of just arise, they happen, there's sure. clouds in the air, it's sunny, you know, one day and, you know, stormy the next, but sure. that's not us. Uh, what we are is, is how, is how we kind of handle that and, and react. It's how you choose to react to that. And it's being aware of that. And then what do I need to do if that, like, if I wake up and I'm not feeling optimal, yeah. I do a quick evaluation at this point. It's like, okay, why is it? Is it something I ate? Is the daddy not get enough sleep? Is it a relationship thing? Is it what, what is it? And so what am I kind of feeling right now? So what do I have to do to shift that as quickly as possible to where I need to go? You know, we had uh, Mark Bell talking about the strength space, right? You yeah. know, Mark Bell. I, um, I do. Yeah. Yeah. So Mark was in here a couple of weeks ago and um, you know, we were, we were chatting and he said, you know, the thoughts, those things are going to come to you and the, the emotions are going to come to you and all that stuff's going to come to you. And he's like, and you don't necessarily always have control over that, but once you recognize what it is, you always have the control over how you react from there. Like you, you get to control at that point, what I do with, with that information. Um, you know, and that's, it's, it's, it takes practice. It's like anything else. You need to put the reps in on that, but ultimately it ends up being this quick evaluation. And what do I need to do to pull myself out and go where I need to go? And that's what I want. Like yeah. for these kids, man, it's that long tail game of developing that skill. You develop that kind of skill. I'm sorry. I, I, you do not need algebra anywhere near as much as you need that. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what you're going to do. Oh, absolutely. And, it, and it's just that the idea that we're framing our worldview or our, our reality tunnel, which is totally yeah. unique to anyone else's, but that, that we're taking ownership. And, and, we're, and we're saying, it's, it's, I'm going to decorate this reality tunnel. Sometimes, it, you know, creatively as I choose it, if, you know, if, I ha- if I have the ability to do that. That's right, man. That's right. Now, now Matt, with the, so the, the learning space it's, it's wide open for, for, for young learners to young humans to explore, to play. And by play, I don't mean like all silly, right? By play, I mean, doubting everything, being curious about things, being open, just, just literally exploration. And I know that that's huge, 
Now, yep. the facilitator or the or the guide yep. in in these spaces yep. is is really important, and yeah. and so they're very um, deliberate, right? Yeah. With with very language, so. with yep. the way they 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 allow for these things. Can you talk about a facilitator or a guide in these spaces? Yeah. Because it's not just willy nilly free for all, right? Yeah, it's not. I mean, people get kind of this. Uh, you know, Lord of the Flies sort of vision, which I mean, sometimes from the outside point of view, you could, there are times where things, especially on the younger side, where you could look at it and go, man, I'm a Lord of the Flies kind of deal, but it gives opportunity for, for leaders to step up and bring things back to order. And when I say leaders, I don't mean the guides. I mean, you know, the leaders of the studio, the young, the young sheep dogs to kind of go, Hey guys, we got to rein it in. Like, let's get back to, you know, kind of what we need to do. Right. So being a, um, being a guide, I will tell you from having, uh, hundreds of teachers that I have worked, I mean, well, thousands that I've worked with, hundreds that I've employed, um, and now, you know, work with uh, quite a few guides as well, and obviously employ quite a few guides. It is easily 10 times harder than teaching. Yeah. It easily is, which is an interesting concept to know that in a self-directed environment where we are moving the uh, the impetus for directing what is going on to the youth that it's actually harder to be a guide and it is that deliberate practice right so um, a guide is there you know and again at different levels it looks differently your guides in our spark or adventure studios the younger kids are a little more hands-on because you are taking this blank canvas and you're like here i gotta give you this i'm gonna give you this tool I'm going to give you this tool. 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 Theoretically speaking, they move up to that threshold. They're a little older. They're coming in with a tool belt that's already got a, a number of tools. Yeah. And so now that guide is going, okay, how do I get you to see what's next in front of you and, and maybe give you another tool, right? Where, so it's kind of this layering. You got to kind of figure out where students are at the different stages of, of development. But the guides are very deliberate in their language. Um, the best way to frame it is the ultimate goal of every guide is to theoretically get to a point where you, your, your studio, your students could come in, have a full day, wildly successful, wildly productive with everything that goes on in that, with Socratic discussions, with taking on these projects, um, taking on their jobs, their responsibilities, have, working through any kind of conflict, going and helping other students, making some things happen, right? They could go home, they could come back, they could do it again. And then they could turn to themselves one day and be like, wait a second, when's the last time we saw our guide? Love it. And come to the realization that, oh man, their guide actually hasn't even been there for like three or four weeks, right? Like that is ultimately the goal of yeah. the guides is to create this self-sufficient environment. So you've got to be deliberate about the processes that are in place. You've got to have a, a deliberate action in terms of getting the students to create the processes, to buy into the processes, and then for them to understand not only why, but how to hold the standard of these processes and how they're going to hold each other accountable in these processes. Like, what does the time frame look like for everything they're doing? How do we actually have a good conversation? How do we have a productive conversation? How do we uh, um, work through any kind of conflict? How do we move on? How do we discipline ourselves to push forward in a day we're not excited about it? How do I, you've got to put all of these in place, whether that's creating visuals, whether that is just asking the right question because the guides don't answer questions. I love it. I love that. Yeah. They don't answer them. They won't lecture ever, but they don't even answer a question. It is a, hmm, what do you think about that? Or where can we find the answer to that? Or who can help us figure this out? Or what do you think? Where would you go for this information? Who do you know? I mean, it is that kind of thing, right? Um, maybe in a Socratic discussion, you know, at the very basic sense, you know, if, if, uh, if the flow of the conversation starts to wind down, the guide might have a, a another question to throw in, a, just a basic like, well, why this? Or you said this, what does that mean? Um, just something very basic that will raise the energy of the conversation back up and get them to engage again. It's knowing when to throw things out and also realizing that 90% of the time you need to back up yeah. and not do anything and just watch 
you know, and well, see where another process needs to be added or yeah. another conversation needs to be added that gets to an understanding so that then you can not say anything for the next two hours. I mean, it is such a ridiculously hard psychological job to take on. Well, it's so backwards from what so many people have been taught or modeled through their own education. So I imagine that's tough, but it, it just seems to demand such an energy of receptivity. Yes. Like, 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 like the people who are, or the guides, they, mm -hmm. they really have to be so, such, so good at observing mm -hmm. and every hero is on their own journey. So it's not like they're looking for one thing that works all the time. Right. It's the opposite of dehuman. It's the yeah. opposite of roboticism. It, it, it's, Ugh. oh God, it just seems like a, a, such a valuable job, but you can't, just, you can't just go through the motions. You cannot just go through the motions. You can always get better. Yeah. Like you can get to the point in teaching, especially, you know, with everything being standardized the way it is, or you can use, you know, teachers, I know teachers that have used the same stuff for the last 20, 30 years, their tenure, they're just doing, they're just repeating the same year over and over yeah. again. They've got go-to for everything. Like they know, like could do it in their sleep, right? Because there's really only one outcome that's desired. And so they can do this in their sleep, man. And again, that's not discounting the amazing people. They probably are. Um, that's just the nature of the game that they're playing. There is no down day like that as a guide. You are continuously analyzing for 30 other people. Um, how do I help this person while being invisible? I love that. Like that's a ridiculously hard concept. And that's always at their front, you know, at the front of mind. Like that's so hard, dude. And so you can always get better. Um, that's what I love about that too. It's just continual push to mastery. Uh, that you'll never actually fully reach. You know, it's very much like a yeah. martial art kind of deal. Yeah. Like, you know, you become the last dragon and you get the glow, but man, you can still get, you know, you can still get better, dude. Well, it comes back to, it's always about the process and, and just like health or strength yeah. or any, anything we're trying to yeah. do. And, and this being learning, the learning experience yeah. is the life experience and it literally never stops. I, right. I, I love hearing you talk about it like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, man. So true. Yeah. So, so Matt, tell me about like, so because it's such a hard job and yep. because it's such a good job, an important job. And I, li I like how you said to, to be there and to be, to be ready for the call, but be invisible. Yeah. Um, so how, how do you find people like this? Because yeah. uh, I, I know there are people who uh, at least conceptually can buy into yeah. that, but where do you yeah. find where the rubber meets the road, the people who can actually do this kind of thing? Yeah. The best way I can describe it, man, is I, I like to use sports analogies because people usually a, a lot of times will get that right. If I've got, um, you know, if I can find uh, a young person who is, you know, he's, he's seven foot one, um, but he's 260 pounds of just straight muscle. He's faster than anybody I've ever seen. He can jump out of a, you know, I mean, he can, he can jump himself out of a, of a friggin' you know, jump over a building. He can, he's just got all this crazy. He's ridiculously intelligent, ridiculously smart. Do you think I can't make an athlete out of that? Do you think I can't teach him the skill set of basketball? And all of a sudden we've got a stud, right? He's just got this natural DNA yeah. that is, it just makes him, he's a freak athlete. I can put him in any sport, teach him the rules around that, teach him the actual game itself. And he's going to crush it. Yeah. Right. That's what I look for in the guides. Yeah. I am looking for people that have this inherent ability to connect with human beings. Um, it's just, it's just what they do, right? They connect easily. They legitimately love other human beings specifically. They love us a, a certain age group right? Like they just, ah, I just connect with five-year-olds. Like I just do, you know, right? Like I just love them and I understand them. They energize me. They don't deplete me. They, they energize me. Um, I understand them. And then I also want to, to kind of analyze them. I want to go dive into the mindset of each, each one of them. And I want to help them. I've got that altruistic streak where I want to help them. And I also see the issues in schooling and I know education could look different. And I also can get along with adults. I can get along really well with other adults and I'm not afraid to put my ideas out there. I'm not afraid to have other people question me. I'm not afraid, right? All of those kind of things, those are, you can train certain things, but those are DNA traits, yeah. right? Like that's, I'm looking for as close to that as possible. I can give them the rest. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, you know, people think that you, well, you go to school, learn how to be a teacher and then you become a good teacher. 
That's garbage. Mm -hmm. You and I both know the best mm -hmm. educators on the planet had nothing to do with their credential program. Nothing. Right. I have, I've had PhDs that work for me before that couldn't teach their way out of a paper bag because they just suck as humans. Right. So, so that doesn't matter. And then just vice versa, some of the best educators on the planet, some of the best educators that I have working here had never taught a day in their life. Yeah. Right. They've right. been coaches. Um, or they'd been, you know, uh, some, they'd been parents, they'd been, and yep. they're just these natural, amazing human beings that naturally get that. That's what I'm looking for. I can't really put out a good job description. Um, I hunt people down individually yeah. and, um, for a very specific spot too. You know, when yeah. I first decided we we're going to start this, it was like, all right. And I need Dina. Um, Dina was a family friend, was just somebody I know. And I need Dina specifically for the young learners. I would never put Dina could work with high school, of course. Sure. But that's not her DNA. Her DNA is those young people. So that's where she goes because that optimizes who she is, um, keeps her the most energized, keeps them the most energized. Everybody feels that, you know, there's a specific place in the puzzle for that piece. You could force fit another one in there and it kind of looks right, but there's one that just fits. I, I love that. And I, and I think I, I, I want to say something about the, the communicative aspect mm -hmm. of all this and the, and the community based mm -hmm. atmosphere and the idea that cooperation really supersedes competition, right? Because, yeah. because this is a cooperative atmosphere where people are having a conversation that's ongoing. They're learning through, through these relationships. Mm -hmm. And I, I've heard people talk about this before who I think know a lot more than me speaking of knowledge, but yeah. they talk about that, that the things that really, are applicable to people the things that really resonate the things that last are the things that people learn <clears throat> through relationships like what we're That's doing right here yeah. and conversations and just yeah. that that base level communication yeah. being more important than like a lecture or yes. or or like or like read this book and regurgitate what it says you yeah. know that that's not that's not learning that can be generalized and 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 you know applicable to an individual but it's yeah. the relationships, the community, the, the, the cooperation that's involved in all this. So yeah, that, that really what drives, me. what drives people nuts too, especially if they're teachers um, or, or parents, if they've been duped by our, our school system is that all of those things that actually matter like that are really, really hard to measure. Mm -hmm. And that's what they hate. It's like, well, how do you measure? How do you know they're learning? How do you, I always ask the parent, how do you know you're learning anything? How do you know you're learning anything through this conversation right now? what grade do you give this conversation? Like, how do you know you learn anything? Do you want, are you going to go home and write a paper on what you and I just talked about? Like, give me a break, dude. Like this isn't right. None of the stuff that we, that just doesn't map out. It's, I'm not worried about what are you learning? It's what, what, maybe what's the new skill acquisition? What is, um, what did you create? What are you now excited about that you weren't excited about before? What's the new direction you want to take on? What is the new, like, those are much more important questions, much more tangible questions. And what did you learn today? I hate that. Yeah, that, that kind of bugs me too, that you could measure something that, that speaking of adaptability, right? That adds yeah. to your adaptability, adaptableness as a human being, your flexibility, your ability to be good in all kinds of different environments and situations, which is life. Yeah. So speaking of a young learner who goes through Acton Academy and then beyond, what are yeah. some examples of things that, that uh, young learners end up doing, you know, once they've gone through, yeah. uh, through what you have going? It's cool now as a network, you know, that there's, you know, uh, so many of us in there have actually been graduates and, and not just enough graduates, but we actually have graduates who have literally now at this point gone through acting and nothing else you know, which is cool, right? Not here at my specific location. We have graduates, but not that have been here the whole time. But, um, you know, Austin has some that have been here the whole time. Venice is getting close to having some that have been here the whole time. So it's pretty cool to see. So, but network wide, man, we literally have everything. So we've got, I mean, college, you know, I referred to it as a game, dude, it's a game. It's very much a game. We know how to play the game. Um, so we have students going to any college that you can, you know, that you can think of. Um, we have students that are going, we have had students that gone to military, we've had students that gone into trade programs. We have a direct relationship with a program called Praxis, um, which in my eyes, unless you know specifically that your hero's journey requires a college degree to go for it, I'm talking law, mm -hmm. you know, which 
there's actually a workaround in some areas of law too, but medicine um, where, you know, you have to, then in my eyes, Praxis is an absolute no brainer for students coming out. If they don't necessarily know where they want to go, Praxis is a hundred times out of 10, I think a better option than college for a lot of these kids. But so lots of kids have gone there. we got a great relationship with them. Um, we have kids that have taken their businesses into perpetuity. You know, we have kids that have their businesses while they are here. We had a girl in Texas who, you know, her nonprofit was already grossing, uh, like seven, it was already grossing seven figures by the time she got out of high school. So she decided to take a gap year, right? Like work on my business. <laughs> um, so literally, quite literally anything, um, all doors, all doors open. And, and in a year, 2020 and beyond, as we're getting into the years beyond that, like yeah. college is, is, can be important if you're going certain routes, but, but in, in, in large respect, like college is becoming in some cases obsolete or totally obsolete and and that what we're going to need is problem solvers who who yeah, learn to find their bliss or find yeah. their passion and you're giving students you're giving young learners not students you're giving yeah. young learners a I chance to find their bliss at a yeah. young age instead of having to wait until they finish that's college exactly, that's exactly it. if they ever even get there like i said you and i both know adults that never got there because they just kept playing the game that was laid out before them and they were told they were going to play and they're miserable yeah. you know i've met so many of those and in, in so many companies that i've worked with around the world i have met so many people in great positions that you know seemingly have everything and they're like i hate it i hate every day i hate every you know i've hated every day for years Right. That sucks. I have no desire for any of my, you know, my kids, especially, I yep. mean, there's just no way. And any of the students that we serve, like there's just no way, man. And talking about the relevance of college moving forward, I think, you know, universities, degrees from universities are at, the, I would argue at this point right now, they are as relevant as uh, a culinary degree. And I don't mean that to not call, I think culinary school is awesome. I think it's great go get it. Like, that's awesome. And you can have an amazing career. And I think that's fantastic. Those people are geniuses in that field. That's great. And what is it going to, you're going to come out of that and you're going to be a chef, right? Yeah. Does everybody want to be a chef? No, it's a small percentage. Yeah. And it's that same micro percentage that will benefit from going to college. It's a small percentage and it's really like, ah, I got to play the game of being a doctor. Even then you're just playing a game because even though, you know, you want to be a doctor and you want to go to med school, they're still going to make you take, you know, 18th century women's studies or something, something that's completely irrelevant, right? I got a degree in kinesiology, but I remember being forced to take geology. I could give a crap about rocks, right? But so yeah. you're still going to have to play that game a little bit, um, but it's relevant for that many, uh, that many people right now. So colleges and some will are going to have to um, bend they're going to have to change some are going to fold um, some are going to change they're going to start offering certification programs um, you know you'll get certificates of mastery that you only go study specific things um, more and more organizations especially big ones if they can do it are going to create their own certification programs where you just go in and google's are doing it and you go take a google cert costs yeah. you 300 bucks and they will look at it like you did a four-year degree Right. You know, hire you. You start at fifty grand after taking a three hundred dollar course. Well, that's really that's really happening that's right now. Yeah. That's really happening I'm in sure. some in some ways. And also, that's I've also heard the same thing from from people who are more connected to the university environment that yeah. that we're going to a more online and what a great opportunity for that. Or maybe not an opportunity, but just what a great um, yeah. window for that right now to make everything virtual and that yeah. all the courses are going to be taught everywhere through every university by the same person who's teaching the same way, who might be sh uh, sharing the information in a uh, perhaps dogmatic, perhaps, right? Like th there's just, there's, we're going to get like one version of, of a truth and the mass population is going to get that. Like as far as being human and yeah. living in a world, not as a robot, like that doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. That part, that doesn't make any sense. Like I agree. College should be gone. The reality is you can get, you know, I can get more from a Jordan Peterson lecture for free on YouTube than I can get from most philosophers at most universities and have to go pay thousands of dollars for it. But yeah, you're right. There is, you know, there is the inherent, just like any other good advancement, right? You got these smartphones here. These things are great. They're fantastic. I can Google anything. I can figure something out really quickly. I can connect with people all around the world. I can do, there's a lot of good things. You can also get addicted to this. You can get sucked into these rabbit holes that, you know, make you a, a, a 
a very downtrodden human being. I mean, there's good, there's bad, right? I've yeah. got, you know, I got a gun and I can protect myself or I can get food for my family or I can do something stupid, right? There's mm-hmm. tools that can go either way. Um, you know, we're going to this, this kind of stage where it could really go either way. There's a lot of opportunity, but with opportunity comes a potential downside too. And what you're talking about is potential downside. And that actually flows more into the topic of um, all of this censorship that we're getting right now, especially in, you know, especially in our, our social media, especially in, in news, you know, in media that's controlled by a very select, like the censorship, um, you know, problem is, is going to be one of the most important issues for our, our young people to try to figure out how to tackle. Um, and it, that's going to be a tough battle. I think you're right. It seems downright um, scary. It's, you horrifying. know, I'm, I'm terrified, but it, it also lends itself again to what you're creating is the opportunity for students to be discerning, to be able to be critical. Because if, if I start learning that the stuff I'm reading when I do a Google search yeah. is literally hand tailored yep. through a certain messaging totally. to me based on, you know, yeah. whatever. I yeah. mean, I mean, if I start learning that and being able to question it, I mean, the big exactly. thing, being able to question that, is this, is this what I want? Is this right? How can I, how can I avoid this? Yeah, dude, good information from bad information. And what's happening is there's so much disinformation that um, you can literally see with your eyes something different than you are then told. And what's happening to so much, especially in our country, so, so much of our population is they're going, okay, but I'm being told this. So this has to be right even though I see this right now, I see David in front of me right now, but I'm being told that I'm talking to my mom. Frick, man, I guess I'm having a conversation with my mom. Right. And so what's another underlying thing for our, you know, especially our students here, it's not just that ability to be critical um, thinkers, that ability to decipher good information from bad information, to take information and transform it to something that's relevant now to, to innovate. It's not just that, it's also the bravery to walk forward courageously with what you see to be true when the entire rest of the world is saying, ah, got to run the other direction. Well, I like, I like, again, bringing back the dragons thing from earlier. Like if you go out and face the dragon tomorrow, you're going to go out and face another dragon and and you realize the dragons are in you, right? Eventually you realize that, but that if you get good at that, yeah. Your courage, your courage yeah. just, just grows and you get it, it, better it and up. better at doing that so that 100%. when you're faced later in life with these, to some people, they might seem like humongous obstacles yep. to you. Maybe they're, they're not going to be that big a deal because you've, you've grown used to it. it. And not only are you like, okay, I'm willing to go take this on and you have the courage to go take on that dragon. But realistically, what's often happening around you is you got a hundred people, everybody was walking towards that dragon. They saw the dragon and they're like, we are out and we are sprinting in the other direction. Right. And so not only are you having to take on the dragon, you've got 99 other people that now are looking at you like a mad person. Yeah. You're a madman because you're walking towards here. You are, and they're going to be vocal about that. You're an idiot. You're going this way. How dare you? Everybody else. Safety is this way. You're going here. You're going against the grain. Anytime you go against the cultural norm, you take backlash, right? I can't tell you how many teachers that I used to work with for no other reason other than I said, I don't think the traditional system is what we need. I can prove it to you that it's not where we should be going with our students, right? I support you. You're a phenomenal human. This system sucks. I'm going to go create something else. And they ostracized me just for that. Yeah. Right. Because I'm going to get the status quo. Because they're afraid. They have fear as their virtue. I don't, and they don't like that. Right? That whole, you know, the the things your dad used to say of like, well, if all your friends are jumping off a bridge, would you do it too? And everybody's like, no. Bullshit. 99% of people would. Yeah. And they would make sure everybody else comes, and they would also vilify those who do not, because fear is a virtue for most people. Afraid of something, afraid of somebody else's opinion is usually number one. Um, you know, but they're afraid of something and somebody else that's not afraid of it is challenging their virtue. So that person must be wrong. That person must be bad. And, and I think it's why 
for people who who might listen to to us um, converse, yeah, it's so important to to see. I think what you're doing at Acton Academy, Placer, and what's being done in many of the Acton Academies, as far as I can tell, yep. is it's so different than the conventional model of, and I, I guess the word that comes to mind is indoctrination. That if if you are in a system that I think has been been obsolete for a long time, not just now, oh, yeah, this conventional sure. model. And yeah. if you grow up in that, it becomes so hard because you've literally been training yourself without knowing, yep. ignorant, this is what it to, like. to just follow orders and listen to the status quo, even though no good change ever has come from, from doing anything but, but swimming against the current, right? Right, right. That's it. You're, what you're essentially speaking to is the fact that um, it is much like change it well i'll give you an example so i i went to uh i spoke at a keynote to project lead the way right project lead the way is a um, cool organization they come in and they bring project-based learning into um you know the public schools all over the country and they do a really good job of that they want to bring real learning into an environment that doesn't often you know lend itself as conducive to real learning um so i got i was lucky enough to do the keynote for them at their annual conference in florida um, there was like 2500 educators there um and as part of my contract, I did the keynote, and there was also a, a group, a handful, seven or eight of them that were getting awards for one thing or another from all around the country. And so I did a little sit down with them prior to the keynote um, for an hour. We could just chat and, and um, do like a Q&A and just kind of get to know each other. And one of the people who had gotten uh, like administrator of the year, maybe something like that, and she was in, uh, I think she was from Oklahoma. Um, and I wish I remembered her name. She was a, a Spitfire man, cool lady. She was awesome. Um, she's like, well, how do we actually change this though? Like, how do we actually change the educational system? Like, how do we actually, and, and I remember the first thing that popped into my head and I remember what I said to her was, well, I don't know. You let me know. How do you change the Vatican? How do you change the Vatican? How do you change a structure that is so rooted, so ingrained organizationally, that's so cumbersome that just doesn't and and financially they have no willingness to change because all the money is coming in so why would they change to change the finances there's so many layers that to get anything to change and all the approval process is just this cumbersome dinosaur that you're trying to move yeah. and then you have all of these people who have grown up in that religion yeah. and you're just going to change the mind of all of these people in that religion yeah. That's what you're talking about when you're talking about today changing traditional education. There are people who are financially involved who have no desire for things to change because it's going to mean money out of their pocket. You've got a clunky system that is so broken that if you try to change it, you're going to find out that, that just leads to another broken piece and it's going to stop the cycle of change. So you can't even really get to fixing it. You just literally have to create something different. And then you've got all, you've got millions of people who are involved in the religion of school as it is. And emotionally, you're going to have to battle all of them too. The only way to shift it is for, you know, networks like Acton to just build a better model. Yeah. And ultimately that model becomes the biggest building without having to tear down the other building that was already built. I love that. I, I think Buckminster Fuller would have agreed uh, that line of his where he's like, it never works yep. to take an existing model and, and change it for the yep. better. It just, it, you, the, the best way to do it is to literally create a new model. And you've done that yep. at, Ac at Acton uh, Placer. And as I understand it, you're the founder of Acton Placer right. and you've been able to inject a lot of your own flavor in, right. into this. Can you talk about that? How an Acton yeah. uh, Academy in, uh, for example, like in Virginia might be yeah. different than Northern California? Sure. Um, if you think about it, you know, from a cultural standpoint, um, you know, people in Virginia, the culture there is going to be a little different than it is here in Roseville, California, right? We're opening up another one in Sacramento. It's going to be a little different in Sacramento. The culture is different in Shanghai than it is here, right? There's a different culture. Yeah. If you really want to get down to it, you and I are different human beings, yeah. right? Other people, people are different. So to, again, if you know, you were going to standardize something, well, then you're right back in the public school model of there's only one way to do it for humanity, which we've already, you know, kind of worked through is ridiculous. Right. Yeah. So what I love about the act and network is that it is a network. It's not a franchise of, this is our standard way of doing the model, right? It's not a franchise of like, yes, McDonald's looks like this, 
but Wendy's looks like this and this is how all Wendy's do it. And we're better than McDonald's, but we all do the exact same thing. Um, it is a, we all have similar beliefs as far as humans go. Um, we use similar language. We have similar systems, but everybody's got the freedom to play with that system and ultimately give power to the learners that are there to say, how do you, we make that system better for us? Yeah. Right. The, the end goal of personally responsible character driven, um, you know, uh, people that are on this mission to find their calling, to change the world, all of that stays the same, but everybody's got the flexibility to figure out how does that work here in our community? And then we help each other get there. We talk, all the time. I'm going out to Houston next week and I'm going to go hang out with the guy in Houston and, and just, how can I help, man? What can I do? You know, we had Jake from Idaho was here last year and, and uh, you know, Michelle from, from Woodlands, Texas was here. And we go like, we just help each other get better in whatever better looks like for each other while having some similar beliefs, very much like CrossFit in that way, right? Like there's the same workouts that everybody knows this, everybody know like but they're recreating a different model everybody runs their box a little differently but then they collaborate together on how do we move forward kind of as this unit too well i like that on a greater level of just thinking about differences in general and to me like differences the fact that we are all different that's yeah. important because yeah. that allows the whole to function perhaps efficiently and i i i, I bring it back to like the human body like we right, have differentiated right. systems and differentiated right. parts. Right. And without that differentiatedness, yep. we wouldn't function wholly. Right. And, and so I think, I think that, that people are looking for other people to say the same thing or think the same thing or do the same yeah. thing. I, yeah. I think it's just kind of asinine to, to the a functioning organism. And, and if we think about our earth and our universe as a functioning organism, it is an yep. organismic whole. I don't know. I think that's an important idea to keep in mind. And I love that you guys are, are embodying that. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Could not agree more. It just gives us flexibility to just change too, as things become more relevant or as other things become less relevant or as we, you know, we just, we want to keep that, that agility um, to be able to do what's right at that time. I really like that. It reminds me of, uh, I think it's Robert Anton Wilson. He talks about how belief is the death of intelligence. I mean, he's not the only person to say this. Yeah, There's a lot sure, of people sure. have said this, but in the sense that as soon as we believe one thing to be true or one yeah, thing yeah. or be certain right. about, about something, we are literally precluding all, everything as a possibility that, that lies outside of that. We are literally right. stopping ourselves from growth if we, if we believe something or, or, or assume certainty. That's exactly it. Yeah. I mean, I'm all for, I'm all for believing. I'm a bigger fan of knowing. Um, but you're right. What you'd have to do is you got to know, like, this is what I know with the one eye over here of what I don't know. And if I find out again, that there's contrict, you know, uh, contradicting information that all of a sudden what I know doesn't have as much weight behind it as what this says over here. Yeah. Well, that's the test of the intelligence is the test of your bravery. Do you step out and, and you go over here and, and then adopt that, you know, I ab absolutely love that. Matt, what are some, uh, some people who have been influential to you and, and, or, or books you've, you've read that, that have yeah. had a powerful effect on you and, and could you share any of that? Man, I've, so I, I, that, that could be hours in and of itself, right? Yeah. I mean, there's so many, I have so many people who are influential in so many areas. You know, I, I very much take on the concept of, a, of developing kind of a mastermind, right? And I got that early from Napoleon Hill's thinking grow rich. I don't care about being wealthy in any I don't care about that at all I'm not financially driven um, but the concept of a mastermind kind of your board of directors for each part of your life is something that I very much have taken on right so um, I have very I have people real fictional alive dead um, I have books I have movies and all of these that have made an impact on me um, I can tell you in education Jeff Sandifer um, who's started the first Acton Academy is just, he's one of my absolute heroes, him and Laura both. Um, it's a husband and wife team. I mean, they're phenomenal human beings, phenomenal educators. He's probably the best Socratic educator that the, that the world has right now. I mean, he's just um, so Courage to Grow, which was written by Laura. If anybody's interested in education is a great, um, that's a great one to check out. Um, you know, kind of staying in that education and business realm, Seth Godin, uh, is a big, is a big one for me. And, and, um, you know, Seth's got so many great books, right. But his manifesto stop stealing dreams that was about, uh, education, um, is just that, that 
was one of the catalysts to help change my life. Um, John Taylor Gatto, who we mentioned earlier, um, you know, who, who recently passed any of his books. So if we're in the education space, those are the guys, you know, those are the people, um, you know, talking about just kind of being in, in life and, and just kind of a, um, a view, a view of the, not a view of the world, but a view of how I look at things, um, from the world and how I continue to push myself, you know, David Goggins book can't hurt me, man. I love that. Mickler's book sovereignty. I love that. Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life. Um, I think was just ridiculously powerful. Um, Jack Donovan is a friend of mine that wrote the way of men. Um, I very much like that. Ryan holidays, uh, obstacle is a way talking about stoicism, huge impact on me there. Um, I mean, I literally could go on and it, looking at and film honestly like there are literally movies man braveheart uh, yep. fight club pursuit of happiness those movies legitimately had uh impacts on my life that changed my life shoot i can you can barely see it but like on on my background right the the lighting's not really working out too well but it's uh it's that it's will smith and that oh, scene yeah. from pursuit of happiness right where he said yep. like from a fatherhood standpoint i remember watching that movie i didn't even have kids um, and I was so wrapped up in the father that I wanted to be watching him struggle and he's holding his kid and he's crying in the, in, in the bathroom, you know, at the BART station. And I just remember thinking like, oh my God, like I can never, I need to work my ass off. Like my kids, um, you know, I, I need to make sure that this is something that never, I mean, there's just like, there are so many little things that I go back to literally on a daily basis that I think have helped make up um, pieces of, of me and who I am and how I view the world, you know, and I'm grateful to all of those. That's so cool. It fires me up just listening to you recount some of the relationships and some of those stories yeah. that you, that you bring up. Uh, and it, it's inspiring. I, are there, are there people who you haven't met yet or people maybe who are past that would be like a dream, right? That's like, take, take it even uh, fictional, like, like yeah. who, who are your dream people you'd want to sit down in a room with and have some coffee? Yeah, that's dude. Oh my gosh. That's so like, uh, and I, and I always take the yet perspective, you know, unless they're, unless they're dead. Um, yeah, totally. I take, yeah. I take the yet perspective for sure. So Seth was a big one for, he was honestly one of my big ones. Right. And I got to, got to meet virtually, at least it was virtually, you know, it was over a, a zoom like this. So that was, yeah. a, um, that was a big one for me, but, um, you know, if I'm looking at somebody that who's no, who, who's no longer alive that I'd like to, you know, and I, I don't care where anybody's belief is. And this doesn't even, people will think if I say this, they're like, oh, I got him dialed. No, you don't. You have no idea what I'm talking about. But uh, King Dode or King David, as people knew him, right, from a big, biblical perspective, um, was uh, the dude was just an animal. He was very much like a King Leonidas kind of guy, was a, to, like, was just a total savage, but at the same time was pursuing you know, the, the higher power of pursuing that higher calling. And, you know, is the only person from a biblical perspective, whether you look at that as literal or figurative, I don't care. Um, it's the only person in the entire story where God says, that's a man after my own heart, because he is right with me. He's a dumbass. He makes stupid decisions. Um, he's a savage, not always in every good sense of the word, but he's the only one who is right with me. He was the only person that was ever said like to be connected that way and right with the, the higher power. And I just think that's, um, I think he's the wisest, you know, uh, that, that's just this wise individual there. So that's a big one for me um, in the current present day, because I love his, um, ownership of his own situation and then how he teaches others to own their own situation uh jocko willink is a big one for me mm. um he's a he's a not yet for me i feel like that's going to be on the uh i feel like that's going to happen i feel like we'll get him on the podcast at least something like that you know is going to be uh, absolutely he's yeah he's a uh, he's a big one i have a lot of respect for him not just because what he did because he was a navy seal or whatever, like whatever like that's which is awesome um but just his view you know, we talk about being that emotional ninja. Um, yeah. I think he very much embodies that. He's able to to really kind of take that. Um, you know, I'll just keep attacking the hill, um, so to speak, and just be cool with it the whole time. So those are probably the top two that I can I can think of. But um, I learned something from everybody that I talk to, man. So there's never a downside. You know, I, I love that. Yeah, I have a friend who's a re who really loves listening to Jocko. So I, yeah. I'm I'm looking forward to your conversation that you end That's up having awesome, with man. him. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that'll be great. Well, it's yeah, it's just 
I like how you said like, you know, every conversation, every, every room, right. Or so, yeah. so to speak. And totally. it's that idea that when you're looking for an answer or when you're looking for it, for, for, for the answer, the teacher yeah. shows up. Yeah. And, 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 and the experience is the best teacher and relationships yeah. are, are where we can richly spend most of our experience. So totally. I, I think that's really cool. Yeah, totally, man. No, so good. So good. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's literally from the, from the books to the people to the, I mean, there are, there are so, there are so, so many. Um, it's what makes this life so cool, man. And there, I know there will always be more too. There will be more people that jump on the list of, yep. of whatever that, of, oh man, I hope I get to connect with them or I got to read their stuff or I got to watch their stuff. There will always be more um, because people are just fascinating and they're, they're brilliant, mm -hmm. you know? That's rad. And I thought of like when you brought up King David, like, and you said, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't perfect by anyone's standards. Sure. But when we're talking about the hero's journey, it's, it, it made me think like maybe he was literally on his, his hero's journey. And that's what made him right with the higher power, right? Totally, man. Totally. If you look at the Hebrew, you know, definition, he's never considered what the, what's, the word is tob, um, which is good. He's never considered good, but he's considered Sadak. Sadak is right and, and righteous. Um, and it's not, you know, we, we confuse righteous with just good works. And he was righteous because he had the right kind of relationship, even if he did dumb shit, you know? And, and so, cool. um, and I relate, and I think I just relate to that too, because I know there's a lot of things that I look back and go, well, that was dumb, um, you know, or that wasn't cool or that, you know, in younger years and making decisions and you just go, ah, gosh, but cool. Acknowledge it. Yeah. Apologize. We need to apologize, learn from that, move on and be a good, you know, be a good person from from there on out man I, I relate to that so i i could laugh and or cry at a lot of the things i've done in my life but no doubt we, without those experiences you're not who you are right now that's just absolute yeah so matt um i i think we could talk forever i really do feel like that yeah. um i i want to ask you before we before we close today though yeah. and you move on with your day and i move on with my day you mentioned that there's the next thing there's the sacramento location can you talk a little bit about generally what's next or specifically about the Sacramento campus? Yeah, for sure, man. Thank you for asking. Um, yeah, fall of 2021. Um, we will be open in Sacramento. If you're in that area, it's uh, on Eastern Avenue near the Whole Foods. Uh, there we bought an old school campus and we are taking this whole next year to um, you know, do a few things. One, remodel the whole, the whole thing. Um, so it'll be, you know, basically a brand new thing we're going to start building the community so people are going to start coming to roseville to get information about what we're doing here we got people from sacramento driving in so we can start finding the right founding families um, and then we're also training our sacramento guides right now we have sacramento guides on campus with us this entire year um, so that they can learn you know the kind of the act in sort of what we think what we do it's again people that i handpicked for their dna and, um, you know, they'll be taking that on. So that'll open fall of 2021. Ultimately, you know, we want to put five, six, 10, 12. Um, we'll just kind of see where it goes. Campuses, you know, around here in the general area. Um, and some of those may end up being specialty campuses too. We'll see. Um, so, yeah, I mean, all that's in the works right now. The virtual program I'm doing with Tim Kennedy is, is we're rock and roll on that. That'll launch this fall. Um, so, which will be cool. And part of what my trip out to Texas will be to go over and hang out with those dudes and, and, um, get a couple things ironed out. Um, you know, so all of that, all of that's going to go, the, the podcast will continue to go. I mean, it's just, life is good, man. There's never, a uh, never hurting for something to do. I love it. Well, it certainly seems like the menu for Acton and for Matt Bedreau is, is replete. There's a lot of good, good, high energy yeah, things right. going on. Um, do you care to elaborate any more on some of these special campuses that you that you spoke to? Like, like, uh, what, what are yeah, you talking about there? So, I mean, we, you know, there's there's a few different specific needs that we see. Not just, you know, again, we're creating these better models, right? And there's certain um, specialties that we think are are we can even kind of extend Acton's concept a little more specific. So one of those is, um, you know, so special needs population, right? Like that is there's obviously a need. We have so many, um, you know, especially in, in kind of the world of autism, right? There's so many of these kids who are very high functioning, um, but then in the space like Acton, it's all about um, just personal responsibility and just being self-driven. Sometimes it's really hard and we're not set up necessarily for them, um, right? But we think we could, it would just have to stray a little bit from what we do here. 
yeah. right? And so, um, you know, we think that there is possibly room to develop kind of a special campus that's just for them, like the severe, you know, I think there's some really good places in around here in the SAC area that, that deal with like the severe disabilities. Um, and that's just not our specialty anyway. So I, I want to, to, you know, them keep doing their thing. I think there's this middle group of, of students who are just are very high functioning and they're freaking awesome human beings or geniuses but it just doesn't fit here either so i think that's a potential specialty campus where we could really help a, a lot of people um there's also one that's again this is just kind of a selfish endeavor man uh, that we want to lean towards creating young men who lead and kind of having a male focus and when i say male focus it's not a misogynist this kind of what you know kind of way it's a gentleman who are are gentlemen yeah. Uh, and they're also not afraid to step into the gap and be that one who's running to the dragon while the other 99 are, are going the other way and saying, hey, you're crazy for doing so. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think there's room to develop that a little further. Um, and that's kind of what Tim and I are starting out from a virtual standpoint that we think we could ultimately get to a physical campus. That's so awesome. Yeah. So cool. It's yeah, exciting, man. It's super fun. Matt, any any kind of last uh, or parting message? I know we'll, we'll we'll pause our conversation and continue it. I like yeah, the yeah, idea that yeah. we're just continuing this conversation. Yeah. Um, but any any kind of parting message uh, before we're done here to families, to young learners, to 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 the to the world? Yeah, I mean, you can you know, there's so many different things that I'd love to leave um, people with. Uh, you know, if I get to just kind of put one message out there, I think one of the ones that one of the messages I think is needed the most, it's actually a, a, a poem um, that is by D.H. Wallace and, and it's my favorite, my favorite poem. And I think it's just so relevant right now to what we're seeing, especially with young people. Um, and it, it goes like this, is I never saw a wild thing sorry for itself. A bird would fall frozen dead from a bough without ever having felt sorry for itself. And it really just speaks in my mind to not getting stuck in the, oh, well, somebody has it better than me or something could be better. Of course, of course, somebody has it better than you. Somebody else has it worse than you. Yeah. The victimhood mentality, the feeling sorry for yourself, the, well, like none of that helps the energy of you going out and creating something better, not just for yourself, but for other people. And I think we're really in this divisive, as we talked about earlier, kind of time in our country where we're really putting that victimhood mentality on a pedestal and saying, this is where you really need to be to get the attention. And I think it's to everybody's detriment. Um, so I would avoid that at all costs. So right now that's kind of my go-to mantra for everybody. I, I love that. And I, I think so too. That's as relevant as ever. Mm -hmm. Matt, if someone wants to learn more about acting, I'm going to, I'm going to provide in yeah. the uh, info below our chat, like a ton mm -hmm. of links yeah. to various mm -hmm. things we've talked about. But if someone wants to learn more about you or communicate directly to you about getting their families involved, yeah. because it is a family involvement, right? For if, sure. if, if someone wants to do that, can you tell us a little bit more about how someone can do that? For sure, man. Um, actonplaster.com. So it's A-C-T-O-N-P-L-A-C-E-R dot com is the place to go you get a little bit of info there but the best bet is to go to uh to hit the attend uh little attend button and come to an info session come to an open house get some more information that way so definitely the best way to go you can follow us on social media at acton placer too on facebook on instagram um you know feel free to check me out on uh, just my name matt bodro on on any of those platforms as well i stay relatively active um and the essential 11 too you know that podcast you know if anybody wants to check that out we're getting advice to young people from you know superstar human beings um so which is a pretty cool a pretty cool thing too man and just trying to give back to to these kiddos so any of those places are great man that's awesome okay well well thanks for this matt thanks, it's brother. i mean i i can't speak enough to how fun this is for me i look forward to continuing our conversation i yeah. absolutely love what you're doing um i mean that sincerely i, I think you've uh the first the first time i heard about you from ryan I, I wanted to connect and the first, the first, you know, the first sentence we shared together, I knew right away that it was like something that, that, that was, was alive yeah. uh, and, and it felt good. So this has been a real treat for me and I really appreciate it. Uh, respects a two way street, brother. I appreciate you. Awesome. All right, Matt, have a good day. That's awesome, man. It was good stuff, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you. Buddy. Pleasure. All right, brother. See you. See you.